So I just got done watching the Shabir Ali vs. David Wood debate, and wow, this was probably one of the most objective butt whoopings I've ever seen. Now before the debate even started, it already had like six or seven dislikes, which is another reminder of internet haters. And I'm just gonna assume that those weren't David Wood fans hitting the button. In my mind, if you already don't like the content of the debate before it even starts, then why are you even on the page in the first place? Anyways, a quick disclaimer. I'm a Christian, and I'm also a friend of David Woods, so we can go ahead and get that out the way right now. Now, does that give me a bias? Well, yeah, of course it does. But honestly, I'm doing my best to look at this debate as objectively as possible. Now, you can believe that or not, it's up to you. And also, I just want to say, I like Shabir. I've always liked Shabir. I've always thought he was a respectful and a smart guy. It seems like a guy I wouldn't mind personally getting to know better. Okay, so now to the debate. Now, after hearing the openings, I thought that they both did okay. Um, but I could tell that the main content, the main meat of the debate was going to come during the rebuttals because I thought that they both had some pretty decent openings, but you could tell that they didn't get to the meat yet. But once the second rebuttal came in, it was all over at that point. Once it got to the second rebuttal, Wood had Shabir like a towel. He started wrapping him up and then just started wiping the floor with him. From that point on, it just got worse and worse for Shabir. Now, I'm not gonna get to the details of the discussion just yet, but when it got to the crossfire, then it was officially game over. It was at this point that I'm assuming that the next seven dislike buttons got hit. And I don't think that they were David Wood fans hitting that button. And I'll keep it real, I'd be hitting the thumbs down button too if I had to watch my guy get slapped back and forth all over the place. Now, instead of getting to the main details right now, here's what I think were the main takeaways from the debate. Now the same problems that I think Shabir had in the debate are the same problems that I think most people have when they attack Christianity. Now my close friend, his name is Joey Fukumoto, he's had more influence on my thinking probably than anybody else, right? We always challenge each other and he's always had a simple rule that he'd always push me to follow and that he'd push other people to follow and that was the same rules for everybody. That's it. It's really simple. In other words, you can't have different rules for someone else that you wouldn't apply to yourself. So you wanna try your best to keep a consistent epistemology the best that you can. Now, if there was one thinking skill that I would encourage everybody to learn, it would be this. In most cases, it's more important to know how to think instead of what to think, okay? Now, if you know how to think, then it really doesn't matter if you're out of your depths in terms of knowledge for the most part. If there's an area that you don't know very well, all you have to do in a lot of cases is just take the structure of how this person comes to their conclusions and then apply that same structure to them and hold them to it and see if it destroys their argument or not. And you flesh this out by just asking questions most of the times. It's like Greg Kokel's tactics. You ask them, what do you mean by that? And how did you come to that conclusion? Most of the time you'll be fine no matter how little you know because you'll find that most people don't do this sort of thinking in advance. This is why you're gonna find people that say things like, there's no such thing as truth, while not realizing that they just made a statement that they want you to believe is true. And I'm sure you've probably heard of them, but countless examples like this could be given. I'd say that most objections are a violation of this rule in one way or another. Now, I'm not saying that Christians don't do this. They definitely do. I see it all the time. But I find this to be notorious among a lot of Christianity's critics, and especially among a lot of atheists. But I'll save that for another video. Now, let's talk Shabir. Keeping what I just said in mind, you don't need to know a whole lot about the historicity of the Gospels or the Hadith or anything like that to see what's going on here. All you need to do is to hold Shabir to his own standards. If you paid close attention, you'll notice that almost every single argument that Shabir made, if you took his reasoning process and his structure and how he came to his conclusions, you'll see that if he applied that same method to his own beliefs, then they would invalidate all of his own views as well. Now, let's start with the first one, okay? So now, the most obvious blunder that Shabir made over and over in this debate, would he would tell us that we couldn't trust the Bible because it's been corrupted, and then he would use the Bible in order to try to argue his position that Christianity is false or that Christ didn't really die on the cross. He would also do things like he would quote from an author or a book in the Bible in order to argue his point, but then he'd ignore the fact that those same authors and those same books completely reject his own views and support the fact that Christ did die on the cross. So how does Shabir handle this dilemma? Now, it just seemed to me that he arbitrarily chose when he would say that the Bible's been corrupted, and those were conveniently at times when the Bible would contradict Islam or his own view. Now, this seems pretty obvious to me, but you can't say that we can't trust the Bible because it's been corrupted, and then try to use the Bible in order to argue that your own position is correct, using the same Bible. And even more importantly, you can't arbitrarily say that the verses that seem to contradict the Quran have been corrupted, but the verses that don't seem to contradict the Quran haven't been corrupted because that's called cheating. 
Now, it's possible that I could have missed something or I could have not heard something, but if his argument is successful, if it proves something, it proves too much. You're gonna have to pick, can we trust the Bible or can we not? Can we trust the scriptures that seem to go against the Quran? If not, then what method are we using to determine that? What the method can't be is to say that, well, because the Quran is true and therefore anything that contradicts the Quran is false because that's what's on the table for the debate, right? So what would happen if I told Shabir that all of the scriptures that he quoted in favor of Islam were the ones that were actually corrupted? My guess is that he would probably tell me that I was cheating, and rightly so. Now, if he had an objective methodology, so for example, say he appealed to scholars in order to show that these are the verses that are in dispute with scholars, and these are the verses that are not, and then use those verses, that would be okay. But obviously he can't do that. If he appeals to scholars on the issue to determine what verses we can trust and what verses we can't trust, then he has an immediate problem. Virtually every single respected scholar on the entire planet says that we can trust the verses that say that Christ was crucified and that he did die on the cross. So that's obviously not the methodology that Shabir can take. Instead, he has to rely on a methodology that's designed to keep his views true no matter what and other views false no matter what. Now notice that this doesn't require any extensive knowledge on the actual text. All it does is require for you to be able to see how a person is coming to their conclusions and then take that same line of reasoning and apply it to them and see if it defeats their own views as well. Not to mention that Shabir said that there's no proof or no evidence that Christ died on the cross. And this is a point that I must have missed because I'm not sure what he meant by that. Does he mean apart from historical certainty? If that's what he believes, why would Shabir not apply that same methodology to the Quran? Well, the answer is obvious. If he did, he would have to deny the entire Quran. So this gets back to epistemology. What does Shabir take to be proof or evidence? Until you can get to that point, then it's impossible to make progress with somebody. Oh, and there was another thing that I found really shocking about this debate. I was shocked by just how many people during the Q&A didn't understand the doctrine of the Trinity. It made me think that the main objections that a lot of Muslims have and a lot of people in the audience had are based on an improper understanding of what Christian theologians actually teach when it comes to the Trinity or the Incarnation. Now I completely understand why a lot of people in the audience had these sorts of questions, uh, because if they haven't ever been taught Christian doctrine, then these are kind of questions that naturally arise. But what I couldn't understand is why Shabir would affirm these questioners as if he wasn't already aware himself of the Christian doctrine and what Christians actually teach, now, I know at bare minimum, he has to know what Christians believe about the Trinity and what they teach. Now, a lot of people were saying that Shabir was just lying up there the whole time. And to be honest, I'm really hesitant to conclude that, all right? I don't wanna go that far yet. I think that instead, honestly, it was probably just because he was in a debate and he had to say something and he just didn't have a whole lot of other things to go to. He had to just do the best with what he had. And at that time, it seemed like the only things that he could really go to were like angry internet atheist style objections. And I mean that quite literally. At one point, he even accused God of cosmic child abuse. I mean, come on. All in all, I think that it was a good debate and I appreciate Shabir and how he handles himself and all of that. But I think that I will say that this is the first time that I've seen Shabir objectively and conclusively lose a debate. I haven't watched all of Shabir's debates. He has a lot of debates and I've only watched some of them, but this is the first one that I've seen that I'll feel confident saying that he undeniably lost. Now, maybe there were others, but this is the only one that I wanna say that I'm comfortable saying that he definitely lost. Now, I know that there's gonna be disagreements, but I honestly cannot see how anybody trying to be objective can say that Shabir even got close on this debate. This was probably one of the most objective butt whoopings I've ever seen. Now, do you think that I'm missing something or there's something I forgot to include here? Or do you think that I'm wrong? Well, go ahead and feel free to make your case in the comments down below. But keep it civil. If you haven't already subscribed, make sure you do. And if you're a David Wood fan, then make sure you go ahead and check out my recent skit that I did with him, as well as my recent interview that I did with him. Now, in closing, I just want to say that Shabir seems like a great guy, and I'd love to get to know him at some point in the future. But if I had to ask him one question, I'd probably ask him something like, Yo, Shabir, yo, what do you mean? <laughs>